everyone. Welcome to this AI talk at ETUI. My name is Aida Ponce del Castillo and today I will be your host. I have the big pleasure to discuss with Thomas Le Boniek, who is better known as the whistleblower of Apple. But Thomas is also a very brilliant PhD researcher in sociology at the Institut Polytechnique under the supervision of Professor Antonio Casilli. Thomas worked on the recognition of AI workers by data protection regulation. In 2019, Thomas helped uncover how Siri, Apple's vocal assistant, collected users' audio recordings without their knowledge. He also has been working on the digital industry from a critical perspective ever since. And uh, thank you very much, Thomas, for being with us. You have a, the floor. Let's kick out with the session. Right. Um, well, first of all, uh, thank you, Ida. Thank you, HV, for uh, welcoming for welcoming welcoming me uh, to uh, the AI talks, and uh, thank you, everyone in the audience, to uh, for um, being here today. So, um, I think the first thing uh, that needs to be done in terms of um, making sure that we all understand what we're talking about is a few definitions. So um, the case of vocal assistants, um, AI workers and European regulation or deregulation requires at least um, one definition, which is uh, that of surveillance capitalism by Shoshana Zuboff. So I'm just going to quote her really quickly so we're to make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, so this is a quote from uh, her article uh, from the New York Times on January 29th, 2021, titled uh, The Coup We Are Not Talking About. So she said, surveillance capitalism originates on the discovery that companies can stake a claim to people's lives as free new material for the extraction of behavioral data, which they then declare private property. Um, so the question is, where does that data come from? Generally speaking, it's when you're navigating a website, um, when you're clicking something, you're adding your personal information to a website or something like that. Well, um, in the third, in the case of uh, vocal assistants, we're not talking about a different type of uh, surveillance capitalism because at any point in time, um, you can be recorded by uh, those vocal assistants. So um, the question is, what does uh, European regulation have to do with this and how uh, do we um, engage with it? Um, as members of the public, but also as uh, citizens of, of the EU represented by institutions that are supposed to guarantee those rights. Um, so the first thing I would like to start with is actually uh, take the very a very material perspective, which is um, how do you produce an AI system? And so there is a very useful map that I would like to share with you um, right now. Uh, which comes from Kate Crawford, um, Kate Crawford's anatomy um, Atlas of AI. Um, so this map she produced with uh, Vlad and Yolen, Yoler, sorry, and it showcases pretty much all of the um, processes that are necessary to end up with um, an Amazon Echo. Um, uh, system, which is the vocal assistant that you can find in a home pod produced and sold by uh, by Amazon. So this is the global map. 
as you can see on the left you have all of the material necessities though everything um all of the minerals that you need to collect uh the assembly line etc etc and then in, in the middle which is the part that i'm going to focus on um you have um the center process so do you see it properly here is it like Okay, great. So on the top part of uh, the um, map, you have the human operator who is going to be the one who is going to try to act, who is going to activate the vocal assistant. And then you have um, Amazon Echo Dot, which is the name of the device, which is going to register your uh, request. Um, I'm just going to pass very quickly with, uh, through all of this because what I'm actually interested in and the point of this whole talk is here. Um, so this particular line, which is called AI training, user voice recordings and data preparation and labeling. Um, because what you need to, in order to prepare, in order to achieve such an AI system, a vocal recognition system, you actually need to train your AI system. You actually need to collect recordings of users, hundreds of thousands of them, if not millions. And you also need people who are going to label and correct the uh, voice to uh, speech to text um transcription so um all of this um is um a personal experience i had but not with amazon rather the with apple so what happened is that in 2019 um i was approached by a freelance uh, recruiter who offered me a job in ireland in cork ireland for a subcontractor for apple i didn't know at the time what the job was about but I very quickly, when I ended up there, found out that I was going to work on actual recordings um, of people who were talking to or around their vocal assistant. And then those recordings we had to correct in order to make sure that uh, the transcription was done properly, but we also had to label it. So every recording had elements that were um, pertinent, I believe, uh, for Apple's um, processes. And among those, they also wanted us to um, identify places, um, music, um, titles, uh, films, movies, etc., etc. Um, so uh, the whole point uh, of showing this to you um, is to remind you that um, AI doesn't come from nothing. It just like any other uh, production process, it requires a few elements, and among those, the most important at the moment, or at least those that are the most problematic are the fact that it requires human labor that is uh, hidden because uh, of course, uh, Apple, when they introduce Siri to their users, they're not going to say they have, um, um, they get human assistance, right? They're just going to present it as a, as a very smart vocal assistant, which it isn't. And then you have all of the data that they require in order to train constantly because it requires retraining uh, those vocal assistants. Um, so that means that there's another type of um, AI is also another type of black black block black sorry black box in terms of um, the things that we do not understand we do not know that are uh, hidden from us um, when it comes to how they are produced um, and so that's also why I wanted to share this reference because uh, although I don't really like defining myself as a whistleblower, I do think that this article makes a nice point in terms of the fact that we need insider information to understand what is going on behind uh, the closed walls of these companies. So what kind of data is Apple actually collecting and how different, and what is the di discrepancy between what they claim they do and what they actually do? So in my case, that's what that's precisely what I tried to do. Um, I just need to remind everyone that I wasn't the first one or nor the only one to share this information uh, with uh, pertinent authorities and journalists. Um, so what did I do? I tried to bridge that gap because uh, Apple claims that they are very invested in um, user privacy and personal uh, and safety. And I don't believe that's the case because I had to listen to 46,000 recordings over the two months I was there. Um, I uh, saw and I have proof that um, they work on millions of recordings. They collect millions of recordings that are made without uh, people's knowledge or consent. Um, and so the next question that comes, and that, so that brings me to the second part of uh, the 
talk I wanted to give you today, which is regulation or deregulation, which is um, whose responsibility then is it to investigate these um, uh, situations, right? Uh, because is it a data breach? Um, in my opinion, this is clearly illegal because you didn't collect user consent. People didn't know they were reported. It raises all sorts of problems in terms of uh, personal privacy uh, and uh, general, and in terms of what the general data uh, protection um, uh, uh, regulation says. So um, the first idea is that the, G the GDPR states that this is a responsibility for data protection authorities. So uh, all 27 of them, uh, all uh, there are 27 national data protection authorities in Europe, and they should be responsible for these kinds of investigations. The issue is that um, some of them are less invested in this than others. And when it comes to Apple, all complaints go to the Irish Data Protection Authority. And the Irish Data Protection Authority, for uh, political and economical reasons, I believe, does not want to engage with those cases. So when you often you often see in the press these uh, articles that say that Meta has been fined huge amounts, like I believe the last one, the last uh, fine they got was 1.3 billion euros. Um, but then when you realize what the process be that went behind it um, was, uh, it's very unsatisfactory because it turns out that the Irish Data Protection Authority, Authority tried to delay that decision as much as possible. And when the time came uh, to issue that fine, they actually wanted it to be um, uh, much lower. Um, so my question that I still am unable to answer right now is, why is this regulation uh, not properly applied at the moment? And uh, why is it that uh, data protection authorities have different interests uh, in terms of making sure that um, the um, regulation is upheld or that uh, these um, companies uh, can continue to operate like they have so far, which is to say uh, pretty much illegally. Um, so, um, this brings me to um, the moment where I say that, uh, so far, in my opinion, uh, the institutional um, pipeline has failed. It, it is blocked at the moment. It has been blocked for the past five years. Uh, the GDPR entered into, um, well, started uh, on May 20th, 2018, and we're very far from a real application of uh, its provisions. Um, so if you can't count on um, the institutions that are supposed to uphold uh, EU uh, data protection regulation, uh, what is uh, what is the solution? Where do you, who do you turn to? And I believe my um, there should be um, we should explore the opportunity for um, consumer and trade unions to actually um, join forces and represent workers and consumer rights. Um, because they can actually, um, if the GDPR has an article that says that uh, um, there are uh, groups that can represent um, well, consumers, users, uh, workers, and uh, make sure that uh, their data their data rights are their personal data rights are um, protected. So um, I think this is a way that hasn't been that has been insufficiently explored so far, and I would uh, very much like to see that um, in the future. And also, just so you see, as a conclusion. I would like to share uh, this uh, photo I took in uh, June or July 2021. Um, and so this is in Paris, and this is a very, very, very big ad for Apple, which says um, privacy, um, respect for privacy, that is, that's iPhone, apple.com uh, privacy. Um, so the issue is not just that uh, these companies have not been investigated, they have not been fined, they have not been found guilty, 
of uh, the fact that they have been spying, they have been effectively uh, spying on hundreds of millions of EU citizens, not only those that have an iPhone, but those that are close to an iPhone. Um, and the contacts that the that the iPhone user has as well, they are all uh, concerned. Um, and so it's been years now, and these companies, Apple at least, well, they continue um, selling this, um, commercializing themselves as people who uh, protect privacy. And even that has not been stopped by EU or national institutions in uh, the European Union. So I'll leave you with that. Thank you, Thomas, for sharing your experience, uh, not only personal experience, but also a regulatory one, a regulatory question concerning AI and also GDPR. I'm very interested in your experience as a worker, as a tech worker, if I may, uh, because you were inside of a very big company. Apple is not a small startup and its capacity to produce and, and collect data is it's, it's amazing. Um, I would like, before opening the floor to the public, and I remind you that you can type your questions in the Q&A box so that we can bring it up to Thomas. I would like you to, I would like to ask you about uh, how, how is it working with AI? Because you were working with the technology in a way. Um, besides transcribing and correcting sentences or conversations, if I understood correctly, are there other tasks that these workers do? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so um, you can think of it as a digital assembly line where uh, each worker has a very precise and narrow task. So mine was to correct uh, the transcriptions, um, but others down the line, when the so the data was uh, curated, um, assembled correctly, uh, um, and uh, sort of refined, um, others would uh, compare uh, the recording to other sources of data that came from the same device. So let's say you have an iPhone and you said, call mom, and someone gets that recording. Uh, down the line, there's going to be another worker whose job is going to compare the recording to uh, the uh, contact numbers, or the, con the contact names in the phone, and their job is going to be to try to find someone whose name is mom, and then they're going to tag it in the recording so that the um, vocal assistant understands that uh, when someone says call mom, it just it doesn't just need to, to transcribe that, but also has to engage with an action. And that action needs to be started, propped up with that specific word. Um, so yeah, there are uh, other tasks. Uh, um, there's another one actually I forgot about. Um, one that requires you to listen to several recordings in order to make sure that, um, in order to compare them and um, define whether it's the same person speaking or not, whether it's the same voice that you hear over the three recording, three or more recordings. Uh, because, of course, the vocal assistant also requires, uh, in order to work properly, um, it needs to be able to identify um, different uh, speakers. Okay, so in this narrow, really narrow, uh, concrete task allocation, I'm very interested in the risks that workers are exposed to. Um, can you describe some of them? What do you think about it? The exposure to the risks, what are the types of risks and whether these workers are aware of them? Yeah, um, I'd say there are at least two big um, um, categ categories of risks. The first one would relate to psychosocial risks, but then, um, I mean, I came across uh, some very upsetting recordings, but I, I, I sort of was fine. Um, you come across very, very um, sensitive personal data. People are going to be talking about very, very personal stuff. And I, I insist on the fact that uh, you wouldn't uh, share that information with anyone. But since you're like uh, um, sending a message to someone you know very that is very close to you, you're going to be talking about uh, personal health issues, you're going to be talking about people who are dead, you're going to be talking about very deep uh, emotional situations, etc, etc. So sometimes, yeah, 
um, as a as a worker who only gets to listen to a few seconds or minutes of a, of a transcription, you sometimes come across things that are um, upsetting. Yeah. Um, but then um, that's also more an, uh, of an issue with uh, content moderators who also are um, um, training AI systems, right? To automatically flag um, um, unacceptable content. Um, and then there is this other category of risks, which is that uh, while well, you're participating in a surveillance uh, uh, system, but it also means that you're surveilled as well because you, I was um, in a sort of privileged situation compared to, uh, you know, uh, average data work uh, because I had a contract, I was in Ireland and I also had an NDA and I was uh, monitored by um, a supervisor who was constantly uh, telling us not to talk among each other because we would be polluting the data or stuff like that. So um, this also means that you are susceptible to be uh, monitored and surveilled yourself when you're, when you're a participant in uh, these kinds of tasks and activities. But then um, again, I would like to bring up the case of uh, content moderators because their job is actually pretty scary and the, um, what uh, people like Daniel Motaun have to say about that is very important for us to acknowledge. Um, because uh, Could you remind us who, who Daniel is, please? Yeah, Daniel Motaun um, is a former content moderator for, um, content moderator for SAMA. He uh, worked in Kenya, Nairobi, and uh, he was fired after he uh, uh, tried to create uh, a union movement uh, over there. Um, but it turned out to be successful in the end, I think. Um, so uh, what Daniel had to say is that he couldn't actually, they couldn't perform their job properly because they didn't even have uh, the uh, psychological assistance they required in order to be able to go through all the horrific things they had to watch and look at and uh, very quickly determine whether it was acceptable or not for Facebook to have it on um, published or not. Uh, so they are uh, the most clear cut example of how uh, all of this um, um, work is actually, um, in fact, yeah, uh, in terms of mental health, uh, distressing uh, sometimes. But also um, his example is a good, is a good way to, to, to remind us that um, AI work is also a matter of um, international relationships. And so the people who worked at SAMA, Daniel said it uh, two weeks ago when I was uh, in a presentation, in a panel with him. Um, well, he didn't really have a choice whether to stop working. It was whether he stopped working and stopped eating or continued working and had enough money to live. Um, so this is also one thing that needs to be taken into account, like workers, a workers who uh, train AI systems uh, are oftentimes in, uh, um, for lack of, of a better word, third world countries where uh, they don't, oftentimes they don't get, they don't really have a choice as well. So that is also uh, something that needs to be taken into account uh, and, and we need to acknowledge even though we're, I'm only talking from an um, EU regu uh, regulator regulatory perspective. Thank you. And uh, now going through your presentation at the end, you said that there are mechanisms, there should be a mechanism, or it is, there is a mechanism under GDPR Article 80 uh, related to representation of data subjects that trade unions and consumers organizations should more should get to use it more. Um, strategically speaking, what concrete actions can trade unions do, for example? Well, um, if you're a trade union and you're representing a group of workers where and uh, you're in, in, in a determined company and said company decides that all meetings are now going to be through uh, Microsoft Teams or Zoom, um, you can and should, well, uh, you could, uh, consider um, um, opposing this and saying, well, this is um, a, a personal data risk for all the workers uh, because we don't really trust these companies to actually do what they say and respect uh, data protection regulation. 
so you can uh, both uh, decide to uh, oppose uh, existing or new um, uh, digital processes inside of your company. And you can also decide um, to take action in terms of past events where it has been demonstrated and where it, the, the, it was leaked to the press, for example, that um, a certain uh, product um, or, um, or service uh, actually leaked data and was not uh, uh, um, GDPR compliant. And I will take one question from the public here that we have from Andreas Dinhofer. Um, going back to the AI system as the technical part of, of, of the AI, uh, what do you think should be changed in the process of training them, of training AI systems? I'm not... Look, that's not an easy question to answer because, um, uh, I mean, there's a whole field of people who work in AI ethics who uh, have a bunch of recommendations, but the very uh, the very least we should do is um, start thinking about the fact that, about the kind of data that is being used to train AI system and recognize the fact that there are workers who are just like in every other process, parts of uh, the production line. So um, about Article 88 of GDPR, it's in French, but there you have it. No, it's not that one, actually. It's Article 37, sorry. Uh, just need to find it. Uh, yep, there it is. There you go. So Article 37 says that you can, uh, um, as a trade union, represent the interests of the of the workers that are part of the of your union um, in terms of uh, data protection rights, and also consumer unions as well. Um, so, what do we do with uh, production systems? Look, um, what I like to think of. Uh, when this question is asked of me, is uh, to give an example of another way of producing a book of assistant, which is, um, well, you can call it more ethical or I don't know. Um, and that is the Mozilla Foundation. They produced, uh, they have a project called the Common Voice. And so they train uh, vocal assistants. They, made, they make them available to anyone who asks. And so they have these huge databases in several languages where they actually ask people to donate their voice and read texts out loud. So yeah, of course, well, the, the quality of uh, the vocal assistance is, is perhaps um, inferior to that of uh, uh, Apple's, um, but at the very least, you know, people know what they're engaging with, they know what they're giving to the company and they know what purpose it serves. And we don't, we have no answer to all of those questions when it comes to Apple or Google or Amazon. Not even now that when we have perhaps a more developed AI act with certain obligations of transparency and uh, and that risk management, not even now has, has, hasn't has Apple um, changed its policy regarding how they hire data workers or tech workers or how they train them or informed? Look, um... They did make a few cosmetic changes in, in the fall of 2019 when there was a moratorium pronounced by one of the uh, German Lander data protection authorities. Um, and so they decided they, instead of uh, using a subcontractor in Ireland, they would hire directly the workers. And so instead of being, um, um, they are now Apple workers. They have an Apple contract instead of a, a contract with a subcontractor. But apart from that, I mean, everything seems to be going on just like before. So, uh, and also the AA Act uh, hasn't entered into, um, I think it's still being negotiated, right? And I failed to see so far uh, them talking about production, um, the, the way AI is being produ produced. Um, and so, uh, yeah, you can take it from the risks perspective, but then uh, everyone's going to end up 
in a uh, talking about there's going to be a uh, back and forth about what what legal risk what risks uh, any AI system is about and then it's going to take years and years to actually have some sort of recognition of the proper risks of even an AI system uh, and I think it would have been good to actually consider how AI is produced, right? Instead of uh, just considering a risk-based approach. In the in the AI act itself. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yes. I think that we don't have that covered. Maybe we need another piece of legislation to to look at how AI is produced and what impacts on the planet and what resources it requires, human resources, but also the minerals that you have also mentioned about and all the uh, um, resources involved for the maintenance of the data and the infrastructure that is there. Um, I have another couple of questions for Thomas. What do you say to those who say that Apple already modified their terms and services to allow users to opt out from volunteering their voice yes it is true that uh, they did that or at least they claim to do that but um they have all the power so they have a bunch of ways to modify um, um to, uh, terms and conditions and uh, the contract they have users sign every time they update the, the, their ios so pretty much the answer is that even if that um, if that was actually even if that is actually properly applied, which we don't really know because then again we don't have access to what Apple really does, um, they have found other sneaky ways to actually collect uh, user data and user recordings. Uh, and so back in February 2022, there was this article published on ZDNet, um, which uh, stated that uh, as of iOS. 15.2, I think, um, Apple had put some sort of clause in uh, the terms and conditions that said, well, we are, as an Apple user, you allow us to collect all sorts, all of uh, the, um, uh, the audio recordings from your device uh, if we want to. Um, and so there are clauses and clauses and clauses like that. I once went through one of the uh, terms and conditions agreements that Apple had their user signs, uh, their, their users sign, and uh, at some point it pretty much stated that uh, they collected data for a year, except for exceptions, but, but for certain exceptions, which could allow them to uh, and gather data, to collect that data and keep it for two years, except for exceptions that said five years and then 10 years. So pretty much they just don't really, if there's no enforcement by regulation, they'll they'll do pretty much what they want because they state that they do whatever they want and they get away with it. So that's the issue. They have gotten away with it time and time again. So as long as there's no enforcement, you can bet that they are actually not going to respect even those engagements they've taken publicly, even those promises they've made publicly, sorry. Yeah, all right. So just in terms of enforcement, we know that some you explained that data, some data protection authorities in some countries are more or less keen to actually regulate the big tech, which is the case of the Irish DPA. Um, for, but what uh, what what kind of advice or or just comment could you give to those workers who do not work in Apple or in Amazon or in Facebook, who are working also in other companies where AI is going to become the next thing, as, as the comment here says, or at least where companies will rely more and more on AI systems. Uh, what are the main topics that trade unions representatives should ask to management? Or what are the main questions that trade unions representatives should monitor when at when there are AI systems deployed in a specific company? Um, I think there are many uh, to come to mind at the moment. And I think those are three actually. And I think they are very, very important uh, to consider at all times. The first one is uh, current GDPR regulation violations inside the company. Uh, so the second is um, 
does your contract does your contract say that uh, you are that the data you're producing by the company and the collect the, the data that the company is collecting can be used to train AI systems? And if it isn't, and if it doesn't, maybe there's something there. And the third one is um, AI, <clears throat> uh, you know, updating uh, your uh, process systems inside a company, stating that now with AI, you're going to be more efficient and, and stuff like that is also sometimes an excuse to just delocalize some part of the activities uh, to externalize, sorry, part of the activities outside of the European Union. So we actually kind of saw it uh, in, an in a recent example in France, uh, where it looks like a company that stated it was going to use AI systems to replace 60% uh, of its workforce is actually going to uh, just hire a subcontractor in another country, um, in, uh, um, in another continent. And the, the subcontractor is not an AI system provider. It just provides with cheaper workforce. So you sh should definitely look out for that um, in terms of what the process they're claiming um, to be um, is going to entail. And so which companies are they going to reach out to in order to uh, sort of uh, engage with this AI production system? And even if it were a proper company producing a proper um, a AI system, uh, you should look into that because there's also, as I said, uh, a human in the machine in those cases too. Even when the company or the CEOs claim that AI systems are not to be discussed with uh, trade unions or with work councils, I or don't... when they claim that AI systems are uh, COB, confidential business information, how, how what what are your thoughts about that? Because these are the types of <laughs> arguments that are often um, circulating in smaller companies. Well, I don't know. I think you should. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know how to respond to that personally. But I think you should push back with all strength because it's not just a matter of, uh, you know, uh, the. Um, it, the CEO isn't the only one concerned by that because it is going to impact all of the workers. So they have a personal, they are stakeholders in this. They also, in terms of their personal data, if some of their personal data is used to train those future AI systems to replace them, then in terms of GDPR, they are uh, data subjects and they have and they have a right to require access and to oppose uh, those data process uh, collection, th that, that collection of, of data and the processes, uh, the processing of that data. They can oppose it. So just by saying that, I would say, I would argue that uh, it is at least in part uh, insufficient uh, as an argument. And you probably uh, could make that case in front uh, of a court, I believe. And just in terms of personal data, right? Um, there are also all the uh, uh, work uh, uh, labor rights uh, uh, considerations to take into account. And even though I cannot speak to that uh, because I'm not a specialist, I believe that this is, I, I would be absolutely flabbergasted and upset if someone, uh, if, if, if a CEO came to me and said, you don't have a, a voice. In, in, you don't have a dog in this fight. You don't. You don't get to voice your opinion on this matter. I think that is definitely a no no. And your colleagues, when you were working for Apple, your colleagues or other people that you have met in your journey uh, for unveiling the surveillance capitalism, capitalism, even content moderators, are they well aware? Are they well aware? that their personal data is being harvested in such a way? Are they privacy aware, data protection aware? Okay, have, so they raised, have they raised concerns to the company? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, yeah, the answer is twofold. I remember back then in Ireland that um, people would uh, listen to the recordings with uh, their headphones on and they had their iPhone besides them, and it didn't stop them from uh, using uh, Siri, right, sometimes. Uh, so even though you were aware, you're maybe sometimes you're not, you're not going to stop it. Why? And that is the privacy paradox, because you feel uh, powerless, because you don't have an answer to that. You think, well, these companies are ubiquitous, 
and also it's comfortable, it's easy to use. And I, what can I do? I'm just going to go with it. And so that's the first part of the answer. And the second one is, um, are these uh, workers more aware? Yes, of course they are aware because you see it, you listen to it, you have ev you have evidence in front of you constantly that people are actually monitored without their knowledge or consent at all times. Um, and I would like to add to that, that uh, the French Data Protection Authority published uh, in 2023 this uh, interesting document about uh, vocal assistance. And I'm sorry, I should have downloaded it in English, but I didn't. But please, if you're interested in this topic, go ahead to um, CNIL, the CNIL's website, and you can find this uh, uh, document in English as well. Why did I want to share this with you? Because they also have this graphic here that gives you um, um, a very simple description of, uh, of um, how uh, an AI system, um, a vocal assistant works. And so this is, I think, uh, what is interesting here, the most interesting here. So they said the vocal assistant is uh, constantly um, on hold. It's constantly listening to you um, because it needs both to neutralize other uh, uh, um, sources of noise, but also it needs to be able to identify the waking word. So it doesn't, uh, um, it's not recording you at all times. It's not going to collect all of, uh, well, your voice or, or, or all other sources of data at that moment, but it needs to be constant, constantly up and, and running in order to work. So, um, if people ask you, is my phone constantly listening to me? The question is not as clear cut as one might think, which is also why I wanted to share something else, uh, which is this, sorry, which is this. Uh, this article is being updated quite often, and uh, but its first version was submitted on April 22nd, 2022. And so these uh, researchers, they believe they have proof that uh, um, the recordings and uh, anything you say beside an, Echo, an Alexa Echo smart speaker uh, can and can be used and is actually used to offer um, um, targeted ads. I'm just going to put it up again so you can see the reference if you want. Thank you for that. Yes. Um, linking uh, the targeting or tracking or profiling. Profiling people, it's a, um, a big thing for um, in, in the workplace, uh, especially when it comes to talent screening, recruitment and uh, CV screening and so on and so forth. Here we have a comment or question for you regarding the AI recruit, recruit, recruitment assistant at the TransPerfect data force, which I don't know, but uh, the, the, the person in the audience says that this AI system is constantly looking for photos taken before October 1st for $1 a photo. This is on LinkedIn. Um, do you have any thoughts about that? Well, maybe uh, you can, if the person reading, uh, typing the question could be a little bit more specific about the, the comment that will help Thomas and us to to go through it. But yeah. uh, yes, sorry, Thomas. Uh, well, maybe in the meantime, we could address the other question, which is whether I am violating a confidentiality agreement. Um, yes, I am. And I have for the past four years or so. Uh, knowingly. And I also um, can disclose now that um, I have been working with uh, US lawyers and they believe the confidentiality agreement they had me sign was completely illegal. So we'll find out. So you have, uh, there is an investigation in place on your actions. Uh, tell us a little bit more about that. Perhaps that will help the audience. No, I am, 
well, I have discussed the situation with US lawyers in order to understand what I was risking. And they told me that the confidentiality agreement that Apple had me sign was bogus because at least there is one, uh, at least one element that makes them think that it just won't be upheld in, 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 in a court of justice. Um, it is because um, they don't even state that uh, in the in US law, just like pretty much in, I guess, many other countries, every other country, um, there is a provision that says that if you notice that your employer is making you do something illegal, you can and should uh, notice, notice pertinent authorities. And that is not included in my non-disclosure agreement. Right. Well, that's the, a very clear statement. But you have you have um, indeed notified that to the European Data Protection Authorities. I did. Yes, I did. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I did. Uh, I did uh, notify. Um, uh, I mean, I went public and I went uh, and I notified with even with an open letter uh, all data protection authorities in, in, in the European Union. So uh, in terms of what I was supposed to do, I believe I did what I, what I was supposed to do. Uh, the, the issue, I think, is uh, down the line. <laughs> I did what I could, I think. Yes, very brave. Yeah, indeed. And uh, showing off showing um, all the risks behind working with AI and and not only the risks, but the hidden labor that it requires. Um, by the way, um, when you talk about such psychosocial risks and listening to all these conversations that can be upsetting, did you receive a specific psychological training to ha handle the type of information that you were typing and correcting? No, when uh, we got our first day meeting, they told us, well, um, actually, you're going to be working on proper recordings of people talking to and around Siri. And that's when I realized that those were recordings of real people, real recordings of real people. They told us on the first day and they said, well, now uh, figure it out. Um, you also say that uh, trade unions and consumer organizations should be more involved in in just reclaiming these type of uh, practices. But do you think there should be also some, besides them, who else should be involved? Um, look, the issue again is that the uh, uh, traditional actors, uh, the people who are supposed to um, take action, aren't. Um, I'm talking, um, yeah, data protection authorities, European institutions, nat national institutions, but also politicians. It's their responsibility. Uh, they have constituents whose rights have been violated, who have, who are constantly subject to uh, mass um, commercial surveillance, and they don't even address the question. And even, I mean, I've had the discussion with a few uh, members of Parliament, of French Parliament, of European Parliament. And they don't, is it on awareness? Is it like lack of interest? I don't know, but they have not addressed the issue at all. And it needs to be raised time and time again. There's definitely a gap there that needs to be bridged. Um, so I do think that the only solution, and sadly, uh, is that um, members of the civil society congregate uh, and uh, gather around uh, ex existent um, or new organizations and uh, that they make sure that they add pressure and uh, also uh, uh, put up complaints with data protection authorities and perhaps even in front of the uh, in front of a court in order to uh, uh, actually make things happen because so far uh, there hasn't been anything going on so that means that the system as it was designed so far is not working. We need either to change it or to force it to move onwards. Um, what type of forces, forcing actions uh, could, could you imagine besides uh, pushing from the company, workers representatives, being more vocal and defending their digital rights? Are there other type of coalitions or actions that workers and consumers could, could do? 
Class actions, class actions. Uh, under GDPR provisions, there is a possibility to raise class actions, but there are also uh, individuals who can uh, agglomerate their claims and be represented by a lawyer or um, a, a lawyer that is part of one of those one of said organizations, a trade union, a consumer union, and represent their collective rights. Uh, so let's say um, um, a Polish, 200 Polish citizens, they are, um, they realize that they have been, um, well, they realize, they know because they used uh, Apple's vocal assistant that they are, are likely to have been recorded. Uh, they lawyer up, they find a representative from a, a consumer union, and that representative is going to agglomerate all 200 complaints. Uh, he's going to send 200 individual complaints to the Polish Data Protection Authority, and he's also going to put up a, a complaint in front of uh, the Polish Court of Law. That would be uh, a, a possibility, I think. Uh, Toma, we have a uh, last question, I think, uh, or almost one, but please don't be shy and type your questions. We still have some minutes uh, with Toma Libonik. Um, we come back to these AI systems used for recruitment. Um, can you trust AI recruiters who request information, like, for example, photos for, for a pay? One, um... I don't think so. But then um, I think those are two different issues. AI recruiters, uh, when they offer pay for a photo, it's because I think because they want to train the, the AI, their AI system. Their face, perhaps a facial recognition feature or something like that, that uh, allows them to, I don't know, um, differentiate candidates through their profile picture or something like that. It's actually, re it's not a good look, honestly. If, I, if a company that is offering an AI system to sort out uh, uh, profiles, candidates for a, for a job is, I don't know, that doesn't look good. Okay, coming back to the AI system, to the whole mapping and this um, architecture that you show us at the very beginning. And where is the worker? <laughs> where are all the points in which we can find humans in um, inside an AI system? And there's a bunch of them. So I was here. Data preparation and labeling. There you go. Yeah. Uh, where are other workers? You have miners around here. What What do you mean by a miner? Just for someone our... who mines, someone who's in someone who's in the mine and who's like uh, extracting cobalt or stuff like that. Yeah. Um, people who mine. You also have yeah another type of worker which we haven't discussed so, yet so far. This one, and that is uh, the user. As a, as a user of an AI system, you're also providing unpaid labor. In the training data, uh, in the evaluation of the training? Yeah, uh, okay. So let's just go with another example, which is uh, ChatGPT. Uh, um, ChatGPT asks you to assess the answer uh, with uh, thumbs up or thumbs down, for example. Even that is part of AI training. Or when you're uh, filling up a CAPTCHA system, right? When you're asked to identify uh, a picture and say, uh, 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 and click on uh, the squares that represent a bike or something like that. That is also part of AI training. And so as a consumer, you're constantly uh, dealing with those uh, systems uh, where you're actually providing unpaid labor. And what would be the recommendation? Not not use AI systems at all? Yeah, but that's impossible. So that's, that, that is not practical at all. And I'm not going to tell people to stop using the smartphones. So they... what, what are the ways to go through it? To go through? When using apps, AI systems, and uh, 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 any application, Siri, vocal assistance? No, you can't. That's why we need collective action. That's why uh, um, individual re responses are not going to cut it. We need the recognition of how an AI system is produced. That's the first step. And then you can start talking about uh, all sorts of regulation that, well, have been put up over the past two centuries in terms of uh, working conditions, uh, working rights, 
um, but also like general rights. You know, it's also an issue of uh, having kids producing producing data as well uh, without their knowledge and consent. Uh, so we have a lot of things that need to be taken up to speed at the moment. I would like to taking taking action. It's it's very important at all levels and with all so, sorts of. Um, Avenues, uh, you spoke about class action, and here I would like to take a couple of comments that are related. For example, it is interesting to layer up uh, and all these um, I, I class action ideas, but not all citizens and definitely not all workers have the resources and the money to start litigation. What is your take on that? Yeah, it's an uphill battle. It's absolutely asymmetric. It's a relationship that is very, very unfair. And that is also why we're supposed to have um, institutions and states, right, that defend our right, that defend our rights. So when they don't do that anymore, what are we left with? Um, I'm not saying that this is the definite, the ultimate answer. Like, uh, you know, um, litigation is just one of of several ways that need to be put up together in order to bring a comprehensive response. But then if you don't even have that one, then what do you have left? It is absolutely true. Yeah, no, I mean, where do you find the funds to do that? Well, uh, through um, trade unions, for example, they should set up uh, funds precisely for that. Uh, there should be campaigning for those funds. Uh, I see that there are... Uh, not a few NGOs in Europe that are doing extremely valuable work in terms of digital rights. Um, uh, I don't, maybe they do struggle coming up with the money, but the very least that we could do is acknowledge the, their work and share it further. So it is true. We, yeah, we need money. Yeah, sure. Uh, if you have ideas, what you get it. Okay. Yeah, we need the resources. Um, but also, um, there is another side of the, of the story. <clears throat> Going to court is not solving the issue since companies will, in the meantime, continue their practice and maybe updating their terms of use, as you have said, by the second, uh, as Albert van Ecker Acker says. And as long as they don't have to pay a lot of money and fines for a data or a breach of GDPR, uh, they are not going to, to uh, co change their business model. So at the end, it yep. comes to how they operate and how they make profit from what okay. is your, yeah. Absolutely. So I'm going to address the first question, the, the, the first part of the answer, uh, which is, yeah, of course, it's going to take years, but it's already taking years. And the longer we wait, the longer the delay is going to be. So we need to get started now. And also, uh, yeah, these companies, even if they had to pay like huge amounts, huge fines, they continue to operate in the same way. And um, for them, it's just pocket change so far. They even set out some provisions and they put them aside and just keep going on the way they have so far. But there is a caveat to that. Um, uh, when Meta published uh, its 2022 results, that yeah, they have an obligation to disclose for the FDA, the, the US um, department, um, they stated uh, that they were actually incurring some risks in terms of profit making because of European regulation. So that does mean that at some point it's starting to hurt. It's starting to force them to change their ways or disappear. All right. And uh, I think that we don't have any other question anymore. It has been a, a, a great uh, exchange of experience and insight. So Ma, and I think that the people in our audience were really grateful with your sharing your thoughts and ways forward. Uh, trade unions have a lot of things to do and as well as uh, consumer associations. Is there anything you would like to say before we, we finish our webinar? So Ma, you are free to, to yeah. take the last words. Um, I haven't stopped, uh, I, I haven't given up yet. I haven't given up the fight and I believe that, uh, there's much to be done yet. And, um, if there are, uh, people here who think that there's an opportunity 
for them to address these issues, I would very much uh, um, like to talk further with them and help them in any way I can, especially when it comes to vocal assistance. But I mean, general system, AI systems in general, um, it's my job. Feel free to reach out. Um, yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. Our community will take that word from you, Thomas Le Bonnier. And that brings us to the end of today's episode. A hearty thanks to our guests and, for, of course, to you, Thomas Le Bonnier, for being with us. I, we hope that uh, you have found today's episode very interesting. It will be recorded in our YouTube channel. Thank you for turning in to our AI Talks at ETUI. See you next time. Thank you and goodbye. Just a quick um you can find me on linkedin if you want perfect thank you so much for having me thank you thomas